So here's a, an example, first symptom, unable to calculate a tip. So this is classic, young woman with a non-amnestic presentation that is toxin associated cognitive decline until proven otherwise. She was unable to write a grant. She had had a perfect storm, four episodes of general anesthesia, major job stress, new home, menopause, toxic site for her upbringing, a sweet tooth, dental trauma with a plate in her mouth, reduced zinc, reduced thyroid, had spinal fluid that was diagnostic for Alzheimer's, her C4A 23,000, her VCS failed, Marcon's positive, and her MOCA just continued to decline. So what do you do for these sorts of people? Here are some lessons from the patient. So here's a 55 year old woman, severe memory loss for two years, mild improvement over the first six months, her estradiol to progesterone ratio was greater than 500. So typically it shouldn't be that high. It should be more on the hundred ish uh, range or even a little less than that 50, hundred. She had a marked improvement with just increasing her progesterone and getting balanced. Then after a while, she started to regress. She kept a diary of her regression. It had started immediately after changing from transvaginal to transdermal BHRT. And so her follow-up estradiol level was zero. So she had gone from hundreds down to zero. Another one here, 78 year old a female with cognitive decline for four years. Her MOCA score was zero, APOE 3.3. She was late stage Alzheimer's disease type 1.5 and three. She had some initial improvement, but then she did, unfortunately, what happens to people when they try to now get into this fasting too, uh, uh, you know, uh, too ebulliently uh, and too briskly. Um, and unfortunately, again, you have to remember, this is a network insufficiency, but unfortunately it's born of excess, excess carbs many times. And so we're trying to be very careful here. We want to give them the, the fasting to get them to be insulin sensitive, but we don't want to starve them because they, again, they're just starving their brain again. And this is exactly what happens with many people. So I'm always concerned when the BMI is below 20. This woman actually lost weight, developed diarrhea, declined, but she again improved when her diet was liberalized. So the goal here is to get people into being, to being metabolically flexible, to being in ketosis, to supporting their brain without starving them. So on the one hand, yes, we like to see the fasting to help do that, but we have to be very careful about reducing the support for their brain. And here's another woman, 54 year old, APOE 4.4, she's at very high risk, somewhere over 50%. In some studies, as high as 90% of people who are APOE 4.4, and that's 7 million Americans, will develop Alzheimer's disease. So she was developing it in her late 40s, early 50s. She did very well initially, went from 35th to the 98th percentile with her cognitive testing. However, after a number of years, she began to note some backsliding. What was this? So the question was, is there something that's been missed? Further evaluation at that time found that she had very high TGF beta one and C4A. So again, suggested that she had either a tick-borne illness or mycotoxin exposure. She turned out to have Babesia. And actually, uh, Dr. Sunja Schweig uh, saw her and has done very well. She improved once again. She's been stable for uh, three years now. So the features that are associated with a positive outcome, first of all, MOCA scores of 18 or above. So again, uh, when you get people who have SCI or MCI, and 18 is now actually even past MCI and even into early Alzheimer's disease, um, SCI, we can get virtually 100% of the people uh, will return to normal. MCI, most of them. So if they've got MOCA scores of 18 or above, that's a good thing in general. Now, to be fair, as I said earlier, we, we've had people who are lower that can come up as well. But second thing is, if they have clearly addressable metabolic abnormalities that you can identify, if you find that they have some uh, degree of inflammation, poor methylation with high homocysteine, low B12, low vitamin D, uh, all these sorts of things, typically you can address these, they can get better. And then working with a health coach and supportive family, again, again and again, this turns out to be very, very helpful. A positive attitude and good compliance. Again, 
Very, very helpful in this. Continued optimization. Don't give up over the, after the first few months. Keep tweaking. And then getting people into ketosis. And typically what we suggest is just start with some exogenous, just to, you're, again, you've got a starving brain there. Help them out. Over time, there are some advantages, of course, into getting into endogenous ketosis. But at the beginning, you're just concerned about the fact that this is an energy deficit. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the people who are of severe toxicity are really tough to improve. So a lack of severe toxicity associated with positive outcomes. And then again, so symptoms for less than five years. We have had people where 15 years of symptoms, but when you get people who are really advanced and they've been going on for 10 or 15 years and they've failed a number of uh, drug trials and things like that, it is harder and progressively difficult, more difficult because they have fewer and fewer synapses that you're dealing with. And then improvement in metabolic markers. As I mentioned in the trial, we saw that people uh, improve their metabolic markers in association with improvement in their cognition. Now, on the other hand, features that are associated with continued decline. So you really have to double down poor compliance, lack of interest. Again, if, if people don't want to get better, it is difficult to make them better. As I mentioned, severe toxicity, continued exposure. One of the most common problems is that people live in a house where there is a lot of mycotoxin exposure. They may have some remediation or not. Uh, and in the trial, one of the few people who didn't improve was because she just said, yes, I see, I've got lots of mycotoxins in my house. I'm not going to do anything about it. So no surprise, she did not improve. Uh, but people will have some superficial remediation and then just have continued exposure. And as all the experts on SIRS will tell us, uh, continued exposure is the biggest problem. Until you remove that exposure, it's very tough to get improvements. And then no surprise, single digit MOCA scores. Again, some of these people do improve, but it is tougher and tougher as they get down into the single digits. We published a paper just a few months ago with Dr. Ramohan Rao showing that we did have statistically significant improvements in people with MOCA scores over 10, but although there was a trend toward improvement in the people that were less than 10, it did not reach statistical significance. So it is tougher with the single digit MOCA scores. Now, having said that, I should mention, I got a nasty letter from a husband who said, how dare you tell people that it's tougher when, you know, when people are farther along? He said, my, my wife has a MOCA score of zero and she has clearly improved. So that's great to hear that she's improved, but that's not the rule. That's the exception. And then lack of support from family and health coach. Um, often what we see is the family doesn't, doesn't believe it. They don't think that there could be any improvement. They take them to an expert who says, no, there's nothing you can do about this. Go on a drug and die. It's very sad to see this. You really need to get it. And I should say that's one of the, you know, poly MDs is another one of the problems. They take a doctor shopping. One to the S, everyone's got something different and they really don't do any of the things that are the right things. And then importantly for all of us, failure to identify the key contributors. If there are key contributors that we don't know about, then of course, we're not able to address them and get best outcomes. And a great example was the one I just showed who had the Babesia. Um, and in her case, she had had a tick bite 10 years earlier, had had Borrelia that was treated successfully, but she probably therefore had Babesia because over 50% of the people who have Lyme disease, of course, do have co-infections. So she was probably harboring this Babesia for over 10 years and it was contributing to the problem. She initially did very well, but ultimately it was bringing her down. So treating that actually helped her. So you've got to identify the key contributors, be they toxins, be they pathogens, be they uh, hypoxia, things like that. Um, and again, as, uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, there are some surprising responses like the guy who wrote to me, but in general, it is tougher to get uh, good outcomes when you have these very, very low MOCA scores. So these are some of the things that are absolutely critical. And I should point out, you know, if you compare what people are getting using this sort of a functional medicine or precision medicine sort of approach compared to the drugs. Here's what you see, it's quite striking. So what's being argued right now is that this in one trial at one dose only, there was a 22% slowing with this aducanumab. Now that is 
a, a drug that has side effects of micro hemorrhages in the brain, uh, brain edema, and costs. And the initial cost was $56,000 every year, plus costs for infusions and MRIs and so forth. So we we're looking at close to $100,000 a year. Now, the group that is marketing this drug has come down, uh, but it's still going to cost somewhere around $50,000 per year. And if you can believe it, here for this thing that may do nothing or may do something minimal does not make people better. The company is now claiming that they're thinking about suing the, F, the, the uh, Medicare to force Medicare to pay billions of dollars. And of course, raise Medicare rates for everyone. It's already gone up because of this drug and to force uh, Medicare to pay billions for something that really doesn't work. Um, it's actually uh, the Sackler family is more principled than that, I think, in some ways. So it's really been very sad to see this. On the other hand, the trial that I mentioned, which is publicly available, you can see it on MedArchive, um, this trial uh, it improved people uh, as opposed to just slowing their decline. So again, with a functional medicine approach, you can do so much better. And we really should all work together to reduce the global burden of dementia, getting people to come in earlier, getting them on optimized protocols and keeping this. And I've published a number of books on this. So more, more detail in the books. Uh, and uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and this is actually from a rabbi, Rabbi Tarfan, who said, you're not expected to complete your life's work during your lifetime, neither are you excused from it. And I think it's up to all of us to continue to improve, to continue to learn. We're, we are always learning about you know, better and better outcomes. I look forward to the day when all of these neurodegenerative illnesses are simply things that are relatively easy to deal with. Mm -hmm.